Welcome to the Mind Speaking Podcast, where we talk about the human side of data. In other words, data, communication, and personal development. My name is Gilbert Eikelboom. I'm driven by curiosity, and my aim is to spread insights that you can apply in your life starting today. So, let's do it. Let's start Mind Speaking. Today, the guest on the Mind Speaking Podcast is Nicholas Kelly. He's the author of the book Delivering Data Analytics and a hands-on leader in BI and analytics with almost 20 years of international experience. And we have a lot of stories about that international experience as well that we're gonna hear in this episode. He has done a lot of coding by himself, but also has managed large data teams of 25 data scientists. And now he has his own business with a focus on analytics, adoption, and user experience. He's running this business together with his wife, which I admire because I cannot imagine how doing a business or running a business together with my girlfriend. But joking aside, what you can find in this episode is tips for the data analytics communication about visualization and creating dashboards. And especially we're gonna zoom in on how to increase adoption of dashboards and how to have conversations with stakeholders and end users so that you actually build something that they will be interested in and use. So he's another person bringing the data and the business together. So I'm excited to introduce to you, Nicholas Kelly. Nick, great to see you again. Likewise, Gilbert. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, we had a conversation before, I think it was two months ago or so. That's when we got to know each other and I got excited because we share a lot of interest about if we look at creating dashboards, understanding stakeholders, understanding end users and data storytelling. And of course, I'm going to dive into those topics um, a lot today. Also dive into this wonderful book that you've written, Delivering Data Analytics. And But before that, actually, I have a different kind of question because as I mentioned the last time we met, um, I saw the passion for data, for dashboards, for user requirements, but also a people focus. And what I felt in that conversation right from the beginning is that you made me feel at ease. You made me very comfortable. You were interested. And that spoke from of a lot of people skills. And of course, that's a topic I'm interested in as well. Um, so I was wondering if you meet someone for the first time, what's your approach Give us some of your secrets or what are, what are some of the things you do when you meet people for the first time? Awesome. Uh, Gilbert, and thanks for having me on. And it's uh, right back at you. Love your book. Love, love the material. And, and I think that's why there's a, you know, a good affinity here. We're, we're, we're covering the same topics, maybe from slightly different approaches. But when I'm engaging people, um, firstly, let me first admit that I'm, tr I'm, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I did not like working with people. So I had to figure out what would work for me first. And uh, so I ended up early on in my in my journey with this was coming up with a set of questions. If you are meeting someone for the first time and you're gonna like interview them and you figure out what's important to them for their data and their business and their you know their, their day to day, uh, what are the questions you should ask? And uh, of course there's lots of methodologies out there. I just usually ask, it's as simple as this is like, you know, how's, how's your Monday? What does your Monday look like? Tell me about that. Right. And, and it's as simple as that. It just grounds it into something that they can talk about whatever direction they want to go. They want to talk about something personal. Hey, great. Or they want to talk about, oh, you know what? My everything's manual. It takes me hours to figure out what's going on with my data and I'm fumbling around in Excel. So it can go any direction they want. But the main thing that's happening is we're just breaking the ice. You know, we're we're talking about something that's hopefully either a challenge for them. Um, or it's just something they're really excited about. And so we can pick up on that and, and, and take that um, in the direction that we need to go. So there'd be some steering around it, but usually it's just some form of icebreaker. We're not getting straight into business. Right. I like that. And what I like about it is that it's a very open question. You give people the opportunity to take it in any direction. And at the same time, it's also, it is more specific than just how are you, right? which many people answer with, I'm fine, I'm good, or don't really know what to answer. If people ask me that, I'm also thinking, hey, how am I, you know, really? I don't know, fine, I guess. So it's very tempting to have this 
this uh, auto response, right? This robotic answer that doesn't really establish any connection between you and the other person. So, hundred percent, and and it could go the wrong way, of course. You know, like it, because if we leave it, if we ask that kind of question, they say, "Oh, fine," you know, or like our in Ireland, how they what they would say, "Grand," you know, and grand, and it's like, you know. It could be hard to pick up after that, you know, pick up the energy after that. So uh, I, I completely agree. You know, you know, going something that's a little bit more requires a descriptive answer uh, rather than the, the one or two word answers is, is certainly going to be easier to drive the conversation the way we need it to go. Right. Exactly. You mentioned Ireland. Um, tell us a bit about that. And before we dive into the, the data career and more the, the business side, tell us about that. And I also heard you speaking about this internship at, in Hulu, Honolulu, where they struggled uh, with your yeah, Irish background or specifically your Irish accent. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it's an interesting story for you there. Uh, but I born and raised in Ireland. And of course, you know, wherever you grow up, your accent is, you don't think you have an accent. And so um, part of my internship, you have to do six months in the university that I went to University of College Cork, six month internship, most people in my year went to either somewhere in Cork or Dublin. Now, the ones that were like very exotic might have gone to the UK and not to be outdone. I, I wanted to go somewhere even more exciting and wasn't really focused on what the internship was, more was where it was, <laughs> where it was going to be. So I ended up in Honolulu working for a, a virtual reality company. And uh, my first week I did 106 hours and it was ridiculous. Like getting, getting, uh, getting up at, you know, four or 5 a.m. and coming home at like 12, 12 p.m. midnight or 1 a.m. Right? and doing that uh, every day of the week. And uh, it's just really hard graft. And one of the things that was because it was a virtual reality company and this keeps sticking with me and keeps coming back was um, it was really my first foray into visualization. So, you know, of course, in the 3D realm and we always hear about, you know, 3D charts and 3D this and they're not optimal. And now when we're in, in in the news, we have Meta, right, with virtual big investments in virtual reality. And why didn't it take off? And I think there's great parallels for us here because most types of information are best conveyed in 2D. And so when you're in the virtual realm in 3D, yes, you add another dimension, but you also have to have add another action, a rotation to properly understand perspective of the 3D environment. And it struck me back then, this is like late 90s, no, 2000s, 2001. Why didn't VR take off then? And why isn't it taken off now? And, and, and so it's very interesting. But during that internship, I had that, uh, my, the CEO of the company, he told me a few weeks into it, he said, Nick, you know, I only understand about 30% of what you say. Uh, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's awkward. <laughs> so I just had to start making an effort to try and speak like a normal person <laughs> and, and not with the heavy, heavy Irish accent. <laughs> And it uh, and it shows that you know you need you need to be aware, right? How you communicate and how people other people perceive your communication. I, and I think that's such an important aspect also for data analysts, listening or listening or data leaders. We're talking to stakeholders or end users who might not be as data savvy as they are. That's a great point. Like like the you know this the the movement of data literacy you know of, uh, over the last few years uh, really interesting and i think i think it overlaps very well with what you just said is you know we don't want to assume our, and make any assumptions on someone's capability and understanding of how to use data and it's one thing that i find that i i almost always undervalue is when i'm doing any workshop or session with with a group of people that I have to preface it with some sort of training. Like, let's just establish a common set of definitions and, and how we're going to talk. And, um, but I, I never want to do that because I have done it and failed. I, I never want to do it in the form of I'm telling you what this is, right? It's like, I'm kind of treating you like a child because you don't know this and that definition. It's more, let's just talk about a case study, you know, and it's like this organization, you know, learned this outcome by using data in this way right and there's like everyone's going oh yeah yeah it makes sense right and and as we went through that case study you know they learned some different definitions and things that they need to know in order for us to be successful and um, so I, I yeah i i agree there it, it is really important that we talk in a way that we properly understand our audience 
and and who we're truly designing for not who we think we're designing for but really who we are actually designing for right because so often also the stakeholder we talk to is not the end user right of the dashboard the stakeholders is a person that sees business value in the dashboard hopefully <laughs> hopefully that's not the, just a political reason or anything else that doesn't make sense but um yeah often those two people are different and we're gonna dive into that a little bit later as well which are when we talk about your book um so before before diving into that i would love to hear a bit more about your career journey where you started and how you ended up here behind the microphone and having your own company. Absolutely. So I actually started in, I, I really wanted to get into VR. So like you kind of will carry on from that journey back there. And um, my, the other option I had for an internship was actually working with a architectural visualization company in Oregon. So I had two options. I could have gone VR or architectural visualization, both 3D, but you know, different one is you're inside the 3D realm in VR, and the other is you're outside and you're using it for architectural visualization, which is, you know, hey, let's build a model of a 3D building, put it in the environment before we actually build it so we can see what it looks like, what's the environmental impact, all those things. That's where I was going with my career. And so I kept going more and more 3D, uh, game engines, uh, game physics, uh, Right, like code. I was very much into writing the code, but then also doing the interface. So designing the interface. But it got so much so that it became very apparent that there was major skills lacking in user interface design. And as I got into user interface design, I started to hear this thing, user experience. What's this user experience thing? And again, the projects I was involved in, there just was no one doing that. So I ended up being the one that was like, okay, I'll try and figure this thing out. Like I'm not formally trained in user experience, you know, but just trying having conversations with people like, you know, okay, well, what do you need? And um, just kind of cobbling this stuff together. And so over the years, I, I got more and more into that where I eventually ended up in Singapore working for a mobile application company as the director for user interface design and user experience. And over there, I mean, I'd learned lots doing all of that stuff. And I ended up being a, um, approached by Deloitte Analytics at the time. And they were just seeing, okay, look, is there some way we can figure out how you might come in and work in Deloitte in data visualization? And we ended up figuring out something that made sense, right? So we, um, I honestly didn't know a lot about analytics, right? It was like a big gap for me. I knew Google Analytics, right? But that was it. So I didn't really know what analytics meant. Um, and so, I ended up working in Deloitte and I knew Deloitte because my, my wife worked there, um, completely different department, but I was very nervous because <laughs> I know they're like top tier consulting firm, right? So I was like, well, what's this guy from Ireland going to be able to do here, you know? Um, but what I noticed was pretty quickly, there was the same gaps that was in, at least that I noticed in the software realm in user experience or also in analytics, if not more so. Right. So there was this very big gap between, um, what we, what the business um, was getting from analytics and what they actually wanted, right? There's this big, just a big gap or what the, and, and what they needed. And um, so while there was like super smart people there where I was able to add value is, okay, well, let's try and just bridge that gap. Let's try and bridge the gap between what's going on with, with data and then what's going on with people. And that's really where I found myself is then getting very much into data visualization um, as a, a good means of being able to bridge that uh, gap. So I, I ended up focusing a lot on the people side of it, just because uh, that's where I thought I could add value. And I knew I couldn't add value on the data side because <laughs> there's like way smarter people uh, than me there uh, doing that piece. So, and, and then that's ultimately, I ended up moving with the firm from Singapore over to the US. And then um, I did a, a stint with a, a really great company called Logic 2020 as a consultant after Deloitte. And um, after that, then we went out um, doing our own thing. My my good wife, Maria, and I decided, OK, let's let's give this thing a, a, a crack and do our do our own business. So we we do consulting to keep us honest. Right. I, I, I'm a big advocate of, yes, you can have the theory, but if you're not applying it, then <clears throat> It might get stale or maybe it's just not applicable you know things change right so uh we have we have that now we're still working as a consultant but then we also do a bunch of other things like training and, and different mm -hmm. and you describe yourself as very hands-on right so that's what you mentioned with consulting and also 
you know, actually doing uh, the work. And what I what what I was wondering because um, I have to ask because you were you 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 you've been working with your wife together for for a long time. Uh, how is it to combine business and a relationship? I think it's part of it is just having clear definition of roles. Um, we also have two offices, <laughs> so where where I am right now, uh, we're in our in our studio, and and so th this is really where I spend my time, and she spends most of her time in our office, and um, right. So, uh, but and sometimes we'll both be there when we need to be there together, and then other times we're we're separated when I'm doing video or our content or our other things um so i'll say a big house helps and uh, but but also since we both worked for a large consulting firm there's a lot of commonality there um as, as well as like cultural similarities right so i think all that helps um because we are around each other a lot and and so i, I think it's, it's 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 a good question and we don't really experience any major friction because of it um, be because of running the business together, because she she's got her side where I am clueless, like truly clueless, finance, <laughs> terrible with finances, and then I've got my side which is the analytics piece. So it is a nice clean uh, division of roles and responsibilities. And it's it's wonderful how you can complement each other. Then sounds uh, sounds great. So now we have some some background right about you, where you, where you're coming from, and what's your what's your background, and and some tips about how to. <laughs> connect with people when you speak to them for the first time. Uh, now I would love to dive into into your book. And uh, I would love to start at, more at the beginning where you talk about the adoption struggle, something that I recognize and I'm sure many other people recognize. Uh, can you briefly yeah, share what you mean with the adoption struggle and maybe already how we, how we can prevent it? Absolutely. So we we've let's say like historically we've overcome many things in the field of analytics right so we've started started figuring out okay how can we use data right to to tell good stories and figure out what we need to do and um we've done amazing work with data architecture data stru structure performance all of this brilliant stuff it has to be done it's very very important we've moved on to data science where we're now like forecasting and predicting things right we're very getting very advanced with it I think the next frontier, I, I, but it should really have been one of the first frontiers, but I think the next frontier is getting people to actually use it. I'd right? like this stuff's brilliant. All of this stuff's needed, but if people aren't acting on it, then we're, we're leaving value on the table. And that sort of brings us into this question of value is, well, why are people not using it? Maybe they don't realize the value there or it hasn't been communicated to them. So one of those skills, I think that, uh, is, is unfortunately lacking in many data professionals is sales, which sounds nuts, right? But it's just, can you sell what you've made, right? And, and if we look at a da data, whatever we're doing with data as a data product, like let's say you've made a data warehouse. Well, that's a fantastic data product. Um, how are you selling that? How are you selling that to the people that need to, to buy it as it were? So the adoption struggle is really, um, how do we get people firstly understanding the value that's there for them and then getting them to realize the value so that they can use it more and instead of people trying to be please use our data it's more our our market going hey give me more i want to work with you more this is brilliant i love this stuff i i you know, take my money right um so that I, that's the adoption struggle we really want to flip that exactly and that's also when i when i talk to organizations many uh, managers at director VP level, they they tell me that this is exactly what they want to achieve, right? They want right now they're trying to push uh, data and dashboards more on the on the business, whether they like it or not. Um, and often they're frustrated that they they don't like it, right? Because there's a whole lot of hard work getting into those dashboards and predictive models. So uh, I can imagine uh, you're frustrated when people don't use it. I've I've had the same feeling too. Um, but what they where they want to go is that there's more uh, a pool from the business that they, who, who say, "Hey, you guys, you need to help us. These are our problems, and help help us to solve them with your solutions." Yeah, and it, it's like the same as what you're saying, Gilbert. Like it can it can be very frustrating for people, and then the, like the challenge then is like, I'm not done, right? Like I 
I still have to get convince people to use this and they don't necessarily have the tools uh, available to them, the skills available to them to figure this out. And, and that was one of those aha moments for me some years ago where I was like, well, there's, you know, I think I figured out this, uh, you know, this approach to getting people on board. And then I stumbled across, oh, change management. Oh, yes. <laughs> This is awkward. It's been around for years. <laughs> right? like, it's there. There's lots of it, lots of different methodologies. And uh, I, I think what, while we can't expect people to become experts in change management, one thing we could do, and if people get something out of this conversation is uh, have a change awareness, you know, just a, a, an awareness that whatever you're doing is probably not going to land the way you want it and is not going to be adopted. And, and if you have that assumption, then you might approach things differently, right? You might seek to get people on board earlier. You might say, hey, you know, Mary, what's the biggest problem you have? Oh, it takes me four hours to build a report and I have to do that report every week. Okay, what if we made that five minutes? What if we change that four hours into five minutes? What would you do? What would it mean to you? Oh, this would be fantastic. It would completely transform how I, how I work. On a Monday, I wouldn't spend four hours doing this. I would be able to do this. And okay, great, Mary. Can we use you as a champion and get other people hearing your story? And it's like, yeah, okay, great, right? So we might approach things differently, even just with a change awareness, because a lot of this stuff's common sense. Like some of it's not, but a lot of it is, right? And many of us have just experience in dealing with people. And if we can tap into some of that experience, right? And they say, oh yeah, so-and-so said, this is great. Oh, I'm going to do that as well, right? Just social proof, right? So I think there's some of these things where we can look at and go, um, adoption's hard, but if we know it's going to be a, an issue, we might approach things a little bit differently when we're, we're getting into it. Exactly. And, and probably from the beginning as well, right? From the beginning before you create your stuff, instead of working three months to, to make the perfect dashboard that no one will use, uh, maybe involve them from the start, from the beginning and ask all those questions. And, um, and I think what, what, what is the struggle of many data professionals is that they are a bit more introverted or not used to talking to people or being proactive in, in communication. You need to have some social confidence, right? To approach uh, one of the end users or stakeholders and have this ideation conversation with them. What about business value, what they need, and then think about, okay, how can I solve that problem rather than, because it's way safer, of course, to think from the data first and then try to push the solution that you hope that people will use. And the risk and the risk is potentially great as well, because if we go do something for three months and then we put it in front of someone for the first time and it's like, well, it might land great. And if it does, but it also might not. Right. And, and then even greater friction might be introduced. Right. So if we can just chop up that friction, like you're saying there, and maybe chop that up over time, right. Like get them involved at the start. Maybe there's a little bit of misalignment, but let's deal with it because we've not invested any time. Um, but like you're saying, often folks are on the data side, a little bit more introverted. Um, and, and I certainly used to be, and I remember early in my career in software, uh, what I really should have done when gathering requirements was talk to the stakeholders. I instead sent them a form, a survey to fill out and it just created more friction. I was like, what are you doing? sending a bunch of executives a form to fill out like what are you doing right and it just created all this unnecessary stress that didn't need to be there if i just decided okay look this is it's going to be awkward because <laughs> i'm not comfortable talking to people but it's better than the alternative and i i think there's really there's not a, there's not an easy answer around if you are more introverted are there ways you can um elicit requirements from people and it's like there are right there uh, if, if at some point you're probably gonna have to get in front of people but use proxies use like something that takes the attention off you right like hey we're gonna follow this best practice we're gonna follow this process so it's not it's not about me the tension's on this process right and all your role is to guide people through a process or an approach right or a methodology whatever whatever it is but it's one way that people that are more introverted uh, can help have a, um, a support to go through this process of engaging the business and, and understanding what they really need. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And, and once people buy into this uh, philosophy or this mindset that you, uh, that you described, then when they see the risk, you know, of building something and working on something for so long and 
not seeing it being used and um i think people will be tempted to uh, to change and and in the book you you talk about the the value mindset and the production mindset can you share what you mean with that and how do they fit in the in, in this context so when we think of the like adoption and driving adoption and we think of our everything as a product right so let, and let's say my favorite topic dashboards if we think of we're building a dashboard we're building a product and once we have that mindset like most of us have not built products um and ha- most of us haven't needed to sell a product but we really need these skills like they're just so important in the modern enterprise because in the modern enterprise whether we realize it or not other people are selling their products to the same people right they're probably not competing products but they're you're trying to buy and compete for attention so people are going to react to whatever has the highest value or biggest pain right so okay ceo shouting at me i need to get this thing done okay i'm going to deal with that right or this thing is going to net me the biggest benefit so that's top of my priority list i'm going to deal with that once we take the mindset of a product approach anything we build we realize we're going to have to sell right so once we know we have to sell it it just completely shifts how you go about doing anything because well the first thing is is like what well, if i have to sell it <laughs> why would people going to buy it right like so why would they buy it all right so and it's just one of the it's a such a basic thing in sales um but we have to f- figure out what the market wants does the market actually want this product? Will they actually buy it? And who is that market? And to figure that out, of course, there's plenty of methodology out there. Uh, we have to understand who we're designing for, what their goals are and what their challenges are, right? So then we we end up with the, the personas and figuring out, okay, well, here's the different scenarios they have, right? This is their day-to-day and this is how our product can help them. And then when we build our product, we're building it with, the understanding that we're solving these problems for people but also how we're going to communicate our product to them later on when we want them to buy our product and and buy of course in most cases in the enterprises just use their time right like just i'm going to go into this dashboard and use it right so that's a proxy for making a purchasing decision right but we want to keep them there so once we do that we take the product approach it really transforms how we look at our whatever we're building in this case a dashboard um, because we have to, we know we have to sell it later on right i really like that because it forces you to to dive into the motivations and, and pains and challenges of the of your end users and i think that's that's a mindset that everyone needs to to adopt and and i think by by asking the right questions in your book you call them uh, business value questions pvqs uh, yeah you can gather those those requirements right yeah what w- well, I, I, you know, when we put like, because we could just say they could ask business questions, um, but I deliberately call them business value questions. So we can just both remind ourselves, okay, there has to be value in there, but also let the person we're talking to understand we're trying to drive towards value as well. We're not just like, we're not going to create lots of junk on our dashboards, our interfaces, just because, you know, the data is there. Uh, we, there needs to be value implicit in it. Um, so that, that's also why it's like a business value question. It. Yeah, I think the, the the focus on value is important here. And, and do, do you have any more tips next to the ones you shared to for talking to, to stakeholders or to end users? No, I think one of the biggest ones for me over the years is having a sense of humor and also not taking yourself too seriously, because um, I've certainly done that, particularly when working with senior executives where, you know, people have said things to me as like, oh, I've all, everything you just said is BS, you know, and it's like, whoa. And at the time I took it very seriously. Right. Whereas, um, a better people person could navigate those things a little bit more, uh, elegantly. Um, so I, I think for me, two, two pieces of advice is, um, if it works for you, cause you don't want to force humor, but if it works for you, humor is great. It's a great way of getting to the truth of things. Um, and then also just not to take yourself too seriously because it can introduce friction and stiffness and that's going to come across as well right so people are just going to not react to someone who's stiff 
right? They'll, they just want to get through it. They'll sort of mirror what you're doing, right? So I, th I, th I think those two things is going to make your conversations and um, getting to the, the core of people's challenges and goals that much easier. Right. If we talk about um, a conversation with stakeholders and end users, sometimes I hear individual contributor contributors say, you know, as data scientists or data analysts say, yeah, my product owner needs to do that or my manager takes care of all those conversations. What, what do you see as the role, you know, if we talk about increasing adoption and change management, what do you see as the role of the data leader or manager versus the individual contrib contributor? It's a, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I think it comes down to, you know, who owns adoption and the, the challenge with that is, okay, well, let's say ultimately it's the director of analytics, director of IT, BI, uh, from in terms of responsibility, but who's the one actually doing that? I, I usually advocate for who's ever building the dashboard in our, in, in our example. Whoever's doing the building needs to have at least an awareness of, okay, we're building this, so it needs to be adopted. Um, generally speaking, what I find works well is it's a, it's a partial role for someone. It's like, okay, within our analytics team, you are the person who's going to be responsible for measuring and driving adoption for all our data products it's not enough i well it depends on scale of your organization but generally speaking it's not enough for a single person's role but um let's say high level the director should have assigned ownership and tasks related to adoption and at a minimum put measuring adoption at as a metric that they're going to measure themselves by to see if they're successful so that you know like a currently we have 5% adoption. Let's get that to 30%, right? And and even just that, right? Just even just that is something, but I think ultimately it needs to be assigned as a partial role to someone within the, the BI and analytics team. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's, I like that you bring this up because we in the data space are very passionate about numbers, about measuring stuff. Why don't we become a bit more obsessed with measuring uh, this piece, right? The adoption, how to which extent people use our work. Isn't that a really important metric to uh, to measure, right? It, it, it's such an important metric. Like, and because there are ones out there that, you know, ultimately, let's say we are want to use data to increase our revenue by 5%. And any organization that's already like aspiring to put a percentage or a measure to a outcome of using data is, is great. Like that's already fantastic. But in lieu of that, often we're not there. We're not there at organizationally as a team, as people willing to commit to something like that. So a really good proxy is let's measure adoption. Now, the downside can that, of that can be what if we're measuring the wrong things? And uh, what if, you know, just the metrics here aren't useful and we're driving adoption, right? So now we're getting this in front of people a bad product in front of people, right? That could long-term impact adoption. So we have to be really careful with it. So um, I recommend measuring adoption once we've figured out the, you know, the data, the, the data side of it. Uh, the are we showing the right things? Are we showing the right metrics? Even if they're not super valuable initially, maybe the data doesn't support that, right? That we can have really good metrics, but we have something there. But it's well thought through then we can focus on the adoption piece, right? But we want positive adoption, right? That's going to drive more and more adoption. Not like, hey, we've got 30% adoption, but now more people just got exposed to bad, bad, bad insights and bad data, right? So that's going to be more frustrated people and it's going to be even harder to work against it. So it can be a double-edged sword. So I think once we've figured out, we've done everything right, we should measure ourselves on, on adoption. I completely agree as data professionals, we, um, we need to be keeping ourselves like, Yes, we're measuring the business in a sense by giving them access to data, but how are we measuring ourselves and our own performance? And, a, and an adoption metric is a good one, not the only one, but it's a good one. Mm -hmm. Right. And you also already mentioned a few times like struggles and uh, difficulties with, you know, with these, this process and, and difficulties with stakeholder conversations. You also, you've traveled a lot. You've lived in, in Singapore, US, Ireland. Um, you've been to many places. I'm curious, do you have any uh, stories, any 
uh, stories about stakeholder conversations that went bad or dashboard adoption or uh, or workshops that didn't work out. Yeah, there's there's, I, there's definitely like cultural differences I've noticed uh, working in Asia. Um, and then there's just like proper expectation setting. Um, like for me, always the hardest work is working with people. And like by far, like it's, it's, it's not even close. Like give me bad data any day. <laughs> if that's your only problem, then fantastic, right? The, the hardest part is working with people. Um, so like I, I've had several workshops and I, I really shouldn't admit this because it's, it's on me, but um, where, you know, we maybe were supposed to have 20, 30 people show up and it's like one or two people show up, you know, and um, there was one instance in Jakarta where we, we had, we we're supposed to have like a large group from IT join and a large group from the business join. And um, I was there as ready. I had everything ready. Like, when I run a workshop, like I, I do all this prep beforehand, print out big posters, right? So, you know, okay, here's what analytics is and here's what analytics does in your industry. And here's how we should be thinking about these things, all these kind of breakout groups we're going to have and the foods ready, like catering, all the stuff, no expense spared. And start supposed to start nine o'clock, five past nine, I've got three people in the room, At 10 past nine, one, one more person strolled in and I'm like, oh, what's going on? I'm supposed to have like maybe 30, 40, 50 people in this one. And I end up finding out that um, IT really hates the business. I mean, probably no big surprise, right? But they really hated them. And the feeling was completely mutual. So when they looked at the invite for the event, they just saw, oh, so-and-so's going, uh, this is going nowhere. I'm just going to, you know, my time's better spent doing something else. And it was like a complete waste of time. That was supposed to be a few hour workshop. And, uh, you know, we'd flown over from Singapore over there. It's expensive. Client was paying for it. I mean, they're going to pay for it anyway, right? <laughs> but we had to reschedule it. And uh, what we did the next time around is we just did a free lunch. And what was interesting about that was they had no restaurant in this building. And so if they want to eat food, they're getting in their cars or a bus and going to the nearby mall to eat or they're bringing their food with them. And so it was, it was somewhat novel to say, oh, cool, there's free pizza, right? Uh, great. And so and on, we did two invites. We sent out two invites. One was to the IT people and one was to the business, but it was in the same room. And so as they were, as they were coming in, uh, I would just stay there just to make sure, okay, yeah, go over there, get your pizza, right? Like no focus on who's there or anything like that, right? And I just made sure no one was leaving. And people had conversations. Not about the project, but they realized that, you know, the people across the other side in IT, they were not terrible. They had, you know, their own struggles and, you know, people heard from IT, well, you know, the CEO wants me to clean out this broken mess. <laughs> uh, I have to get that done, you know, and I've got my priorities, <laughs> right? You want me to do this dashboard last minute, right? Um, and so they got to hear and, and it, it actually took months to get them back together again so we could actually work on a project. But, you know, those things, the people things and understanding the the challenges, and you'd mentioned politics earlier, Gilbert, um, right? Like having to deal with politics, being aware that we have to deal with politics and then finding out what the politics actually are. Like, and that's some of the hardest stuff in working on, working in data is because data can surface a lot of things that potentially people don't want to surface. We have to navigate this and figure out, okay, well, Maybe we can't do everything we want with data right away. Maybe we just have to see this as a journey. And that's the perspective that I take that I've learned over the years in dealing with people is, look, it's all just going to be a journey. You're not going to get the results you want in a week, maybe two years, maybe three years, right? But if we take that approach, right, we're not just, and I love this idea of like data storytelling because there's the storytelling in the data, which is really important. But then there's the storytelling that goes on of the people around the data. It's like, how do we bring them on a journey? The kind of longer journey of driving adoption and getting them on board. Um, so yeah, just over the years of just having to deal with people, I've had to reset my expectations on how long this stuff actually takes. And I think when we do that, it makes it easier, um, right? And, and uh, it's more realistic. We get more re realistic timelines. And I'm completely with you. I mean, numbers are easy right but working with people is 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 a challenge always you know put people in the room and definitely there will be 
some some hassle at some point um and it's also the, the the fun stuff right it's by by being curious i think you can solve those problems most easily and still they're challenging but i agree working with people is always a challenge and i love the idea about bringing data storytelling not just to explain what the numbers are but also to bring uh, to facilitate the change process and to bring people on board, get their buy-in. And when you mention data storytelling, I'm also curious what what's your definition of data storytelling? Because a lot of diff- people have different definitions or different views about what data storytelling actually is. I think, I th- yeah, I, I think the part of the challenge is is the the medium that we're going to deliver it, the forum. So when I when I first got into analytics and data visualization, I first thought of it as, okay, I've heard this term data storytelling. It wasn't a big thing back then. Um, but my assumption is, okay, it's something you do in data visualization, right? It, it's related to data visualization. And then for me, because everything's solved with a dashboard, I just assumed it's like, okay, data storytelling happens in a dashboard. And it really depends, right? So let's say we're going to deliver a presentation to you know, a bunch of executives in a, in, a, in a business. We're not necessarily going to be presenting it in a dashboard. We might be, but we mightn't be. And it might be in, in the form of slides, right? And so for me, firstly, delivery matters. Okay, how are we trying to tell the story? Is it through a dashboard that people are logging into, let's say once a week, once a day, whatever? Are we trying to do it in a curated experience where I've been able to create and craft the visuals to tell a specific story of something that I found in the data. For me, I think they're, it's two different things, right? So firstly, they're both important and it's a, it's a matter of, okay, well, what's the delivery method? So firstly, I think there's that. Then if we dive down into either of those, so can you do storytelling with slides? Yes. hundred percent, right? Like hundred percent. Can you do it in a dashboard? Okay. Depends what type of dashboard we're talking about, right? So if it's a, you know, just a a, a typical operational dashboard, just look, here's what's going on with the business. Fine. Sometimes there'll be a story. Sometimes there won't, right? Like what if everything's just fine, nothing of concern going on in the business, then all right, there's nothing really alarming. Uh, So there's no story, right? Um, But more often than not, the way I design dashboards, which is probably different to most types of dashboards that are out there. Cause I think most dashboards out there are more like a report, right? It's just like, it's a report, right? Like, and, and that's fine, right? It has its place. And it, it doesn't mean we have to do data storytelling in every single scenario. Um, reports have their place, you know, like, but for me, can you tell a story in a dashboard? I think you can, if you properly engage with the business at an appropriate cadence. So what's an appropriate cadence? For me, it's three months. A dashboard should have a life to it and a cadence and an an iteration to it that both affords a proper adoption, change to happen, and for people to react to the data that's in the business so that their action and reaction to what's in there is impacting their environment and the business. And we need a feedback loop so that what their actions are doing to the business and the environment are being taken because they're moving the business forward so that the dashboard now reflects that change in, in the environment, in the business and in the people and in the data. So all of these things coming together. So it becomes a living thing. So why, when we take that approach, I think absolutely you can tell a story in a dashboard. Um, will you have a story every single time? Probably not, right? Like let's say yesterday, uh, there was something calling your attention in your dashboard. It was like, oh, we're out of inventory in that store and we take action on it. We we stock the inventory. We're out of inventory for X and Y Z reasons, whatever. The story is there because we've designed our dashboard that way. Well, I look in today and it's like, okay, no story. Right? There's nothing there. Right? There's like, everything's kind of great. There's... Yeah. Vacation or no, no conflict, right? No. And then there's also no, no story. Cause if it's just, all right. Mm-hmm. So, so what I, what I've noticed is some people might say that's not storytelling. Well, in and of that moment, it's not storytelling, but it, it, I, I, I think it's a definitions challenge that we have is uh, what is data storytelling? That's one part of it, but then why are we doing it? Right? 
why are we doing this? Because we want people to take action. We want people to get value from their data. And, and that's really what, you know, I think that the true purpose of storytelling is it's a vehicle of getting there. It's a means of getting there. It's not the only means of getting there, but it is a means of getting there. So I think sometimes we potentially lose sight of that, that the, the storytelling piece is really to drive behavioral change and behavioral outcomes. And, and it's a vehicle, a very good vehicle for doing it, but it's certainly not the only one. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a powerful vehicle. And what I see to share with my, my perspective, what I see with many people is that they see just the visualization, just one graph as a story by definition. I don't think it's true. You also need yeah, some, some, some conflict, some attention in a story and whether, and I, I like your observation about the dashboard, right? I, I think my view is and was, uh, when the dashboard is very hard to create, uh, to have stories because you, you cannot really control the narrative, right? There might pop up a, a, a challenge that you then can solve, but then maybe it's outside of the dashboard. Maybe it's only the problem that pops up in the dashboard. Um, but I agree, you know, we, we, we need to, there's a lot of focus on storytelling and sometimes organizations come to me and they say, yeah, we, uh, we need to have a training about storytelling. And I ask them, what do you mean? You know, what can you tell more about the challenges? And then they talk a lot about, yeah, we don't understand what is the, the business problem and um, yeah, now about persuasion skills, the sales uh, skills that you mentioned, the business value mindset, those things that are things that they don't explicitly mention often, but they that's actually the challenge. So it's not just the data storytelling, doing the presentation or saying, uh, telling a story about the data, but also you need to yeah give a presentation that makes sense in the first place. So I like that you emphasize that point because the the process is so much bigger than just the last piece of the product, right? The dashboard or the presentation that you give. And I, I think that's the challenge is we expect a lot of, of data storytelling. I, I think it's like the expectation that's still there of data visualization. It's like, you know, what is data visualization? Well, you could say it is, you know, the representation of data in a visual form. Yes. But what should it be doing? Well, it should be influencing decision making based off what the environment is saying. But data visualization doesn't say that as a definition, right? So I think it's in part a definitions problem, in part a misunderstanding problem. Because like, like the example you gave there, okay, they're struggling with, you know, understanding what the business needs, right? Well, that's not really a storytelling problem. That's a yeah, like you're saying, like it's it's change management, it's requirements, it's, you know, right, like user experience, right? It's all these other things that in by by not having experience or knowledge in other in those areas, people kind of gravitate to the term data storytelling as a means of getting there, right? Like, so we are sort of expecting a lot from data storytelling and what it can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Right. You uh, you make a lot of contact on on content on LinkedIn and and, and also YouTube about data visualization as well. Um, and today I, I I binged your videos a bit, which were uh, very insightful. So I would definitely recommend people to to um, to visit the YouTube channel. I'll include a link. Um, you in one of the videos you uh, you talked about the data to ink ratio of uh, Edward Tufte. Can you uh, briefly explain for people who don't know what that is? Because I think it's a powerful concept. Yeah, for sure. So there's two types of ink we use in a visualization. There's ink used to show data, and then there's ink used to actually show the visualization. What we want to do is have as much ink showing data as possible and minimize the amount of ink we're using to show the visual. So what do I mean by that? Ink to show data, imagine bars, right? So you got bars in your chart that's showing data. You might have lines in your chart to help you scan left to right what's on to the scale. But if we just put the number directly on the bar, we don't need the lines anymore. Right, so we're increasing the data to ink ratio by minimizing the amount of non-data visual visuals or ink to represent it. Now, um, for for me, there's a there's a there's a balance as well because there's also good design, and and so we don't want to completely forbid non-data ink if it means the design is going to continually look very very bland. Um, and I'm, I do this myself. Mo many of my dashboards and visualizations look very bland because we want to highlight and draw attention, which is the purpose of the data to ink ratios. We want to draw people's attention 
when we need to. So there's huge value in doing that. Um, but we do need to balance it with um, having some ink there so that it doesn't look completely bland. You know, and that can just be font. It could just be, right, just how we size it, different placements, right? That, but still minimizing it. But yeah, that in, in a nutshell, the data ink ratio exists so we can draw the user's attention to what really matters is the, the ultimate intent. And when I look at the the, the average data analysts that can f definitely benefit from this concept because what I see and hear from people is that many data analysts tend to include too much, you know, they want to include too many details because they think they're important. And then it comes back to what do does my audience find important, you know, to which extent are they interested in all these details and maybe you still want to include more detail, but put them on four separate slides, right? So you control the narrative and show it step by step. Um, so I think that's that's very helpful. And of course, it yeah, you don't want to de delete everything because there needs to be something there. Uh, but I think the main challenge for many data analysts is more to to remove rather than to to add. I I, th I think it's partly also a design struggle because you could. You can you can look at the data ink ratio, and that applies to the field of analytics. But you can also look at minimalist design in like many user interface fields, right? And and a similar concept, right? It's like we just want to minimize color where appropriate, um, but use it where it's important, right? Of course, marketing does it all the time with brand, right? Right. So it's the similar con concept: is we have people looking at something, a visual. We want to control where we draw their attention and the data to ink ratio is a way to do that. And like to your point, right? Like a lot of people in any field don't know how to design. And so the data to ink ratio is a methodology to help people in the analytics field design well. Mm -hmm, exactly. And it also make, makes me think about um, this image that I saw on the internet where they first showed a, an average employee um, employee application from a big enterprise, right? With 500 fields that you probably don't need, but you actually need to fill them in, which is totally not uh, not a great user experience. And then next to that, uh, a picture or image of Google, right? Google the homepage, just one bar where you can type in and a search button and that's it. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to show that contrast and also to uh, convey the message of simplicity and the power of that. It's so important. What user experience can do for analytics is, you know, like your example, like imagine how we used to search the web. It was by category, right? So you, like you just have all of these things you could click, um, right? And when you look at who developed that interface, it's a software developer, right? So what's important to them? Features. Because they built the features. So the interface, lo and behold, has features. All the features they could fit on the interface. But then you come along with a user experience professional, they say, what does the user need? Completely different perspective. They're worlds apart. A user just needs to find what they're looking for, right? And so, okay, well, how do we best facilitate that? Search bar, a extensible, a scalable search bar that I, as a very basic user, I can type in a simple natural language term, or if I'm more skilled and capable, I can query it right with with in different more detailed sophisticated ways so i can narrow my search down even more that it's a brilliant example of of what happened to the realm of software and interface design and what's happening and needs to happen in the analytics field we need a similar shift mm -hmm. absolutely uh, one of the ways to get there is the yeah dashboard wireframe kit to collect those uh, requirements uh, early uh, it's something you created. It's it's kind of a, a, it looks like a card game, but of course it's a professional tool. Um, can you tell a bit more why why you created it? And I, I think it's always fascinating when people uh, use kind of gamification or create a game of, uh, that facilitates the conversation, right? And if it doesn't happen, we have this crazy application with 500 fields. So to facilitate that conversation and create data products that are actually uh, people want to use. So. Tell us a bit about the dashboard wireframe kit. So when I was working, um, doing workshops, so I'd, I'd be doing like day in and day out doing workshops with executives on what do they need to get from their data and, and where's the value. And when I started doing that, I was like, hey, awesome. We've got these really high tech touch screens. They look fantastic. We've got this view of, you know, 
the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, no expense spared, beautiful space. And I was all about using the technology. And uh, to my <laughs> to my disappointment, uh, over time, it's just became very obvious that people liked using sticky notes a lot and whiteboards. <laughs> so like very low tech. And I was like, guys, we're working with data. This is cutting edge. Stop using the low tech stuff. And uh, but eventually it was like, I'm like, OK, I give up. <laughs> Let's just go low tech. And um, I started finding there's like no matter the industry, no matter the people we're working with, there is a set number of steps you need to go through on a whiteboard right? that you can quickly go through a set of requirements, get alignment from people and agree on a set of next steps, you know, basically uh, specifically to dashboards. And so over the years, I started to start templatizing right? and, and it's like usually they're big posters and I print out the poster, stick it up on the walls and we work through it. And then I started getting smaller and smaller and I was like, actually, you know, I could just do this one on one. So why don't we explore that? And so I ended up doing that. And so a few years ago, um, I, I, I did a crowdfunding on Kickstarter for the dashboard wireframe kit, which is just like a distillation of what I do in a workshop, like very simple distillation of just keeping it low tech and because just people responded to it. And um, that, that like it, it really works, which is the thing that's surprising. Like board games, if you look on Kickstarter, are the most popular thing that is uh, funded. And so I was like, let's do a board game version of, you know, wireframing. And and so uh, that was fun. And uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll announce here, Gilbert, I know I didn't tell you, um, but we're doing a second edition and we're going to we're going to go fund in it as well. It's not available yet, but um, it, I learned so much from doing a Kickstarter about analytics. What did you learn? If your if your life depends on it, <laughs> your livelihood depends on it, and you're building a product, how do you make make it successful? And then I was like, maybe you should do that for dashboards <laughs> in general. And and that's then where I stumbled on. I, I want to give a plug for a book from uh, Jeff Walker. It's called The Product Launch Formula. Anyone in analytics should read it because if if we if we agree with the notion that any data pro, any data you're doing work work you're doing is ultimately building a data product, you need to know how to launch it and and sell it. And that's a really good book that condenses it, condenses it very well. That's the product launch formula by Jeff Walker. Brilliant book. Um, I use that stuff all the time with my own dashboards that I'm building for clients. So. Um, but but I, I also had to read that to do the dashboard wireframe kit. How do you productize something and sell it and get people to buy it? So it was, it was a great learning. And, and fortunately, I got to apply it back into uh, my, my work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome to, to hear how all those lessons, you know, unexpectedly maybe, um, yeah, fit in, fit in your own products and fit in the story of stakeholder conversations. Um, what I would love to do is is, is have a few uh, uh, short questions, and then we uh, we go, we're crouching uh, until the end. So I'm not sure if that's a right expression, um, but anyways, we're approaching the end. Uh, we're gonna have some quick questions now, and then um, some uh, some last questions. Um, so first question is rather easy. USA or Ireland? USA. Wow. Okay. Unexpected. Uh, you travel a lot. Uh, what country has given you most stories? Singapore. And if you started, uh, you started your career in data and, and dashboard design all over, what is the first soft skill that you would learn? Facilitating workshops. And what is your favorite tip for creating dashboards? Wireframing. You got a wireframe. It's going to save you so much trouble in the long term. Then uh, lastly, do you have yeah, some practical tips for, for communicating as a, as an analyst? I think a really important, um, really important advice here is Go talk to people. It, it is, it's the biggest thing you can do is go have conversations and just get started doing it. Also, another tip would be 
don't try and solve everything in one go. Set expectations appropriately and iterate through what you need to do. So if you're building a dashboard, right, people want to answer 50 questions from the business. Okay, well, maybe version one, you can answer three. And version two, you're going to answer five, right? And you, but you let people know, right? So they're aware version one, hey, it's not going to be everything. But if you wireframe version 10, right, they're going, mm, it's coming. Thank you for painting that picture for me. Uh, we'll get there, right? So that's the value of wireframing is it can make this, this so much easier to communicate these things. And then it's not about you. You're using different tools and methodologies to maybe take the attention off you and put it on a best practice. Right? So if you don't feel conf confident doing some of these things, leverage best practice and make it clear you're leveraging best practice because very few people are going to go, oh no, I don't want to follow a best practice, <laughs> right? So it can take some of the attention off you. Great, great tips. Thank you very much. And when they see the picture in the future, right, what they're working towards, I think it's so much easier to get their buy-in from stakeholders or end users and and keep it, right? And and build it step by step instead of working on some on something for so long and then discovering that the adoption is low. People will usually only give their proper feedback once they see something visually. Right? And and, and so the faster we can get there, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Such a fun conversation. Uh, I learned a lot and I'm sure the people that are listening to, um, what is, what is one big takeaway you want people to yeah, take away from this episode? Uh, okay. I think start, you need to start somewhere. You should start where you're most comfortable and that might not be going, having conversations with people. If it is great keep it light. So what, what I suggest is always focus on simplicity. Um, when you want to start down this path and, you know, Gilbert, obviously it's, it's a, it's a path that you, you do as well, right. Is, is understanding people. Um, so what I would say is the easiest thing to do is have a change awareness. Just that if you're going to do anything, just start thinking you need to have a change awareness because what you're doing with data is, but should have an impact should change the business. If we're, if it doesn't, then why are we doing it? Right? So have a change awareness is my, my one takeaway. I think that is going to have a large impact for people. And because when you have a change awareness, you also then have to have a product mindset, right? So, um, I, I would leave it at change awareness. Yeah. Then the last question, I, I know you work on so many things. You mentioned consulting, right? You have a book, this one. Highly recommend it. Um, you have courses, live seminars. Uh, you have this product. Next next version, you just told me. Um, first of all, selfish question. I'm curious, how do you combine all this? Um, and how do you keep balance? Uh, and second, what do you? Yeah, what is your focus at the moment to give people some context? So yeah, combining it, I, I usually just start early. So I, I usually get up at 4.30 in the morning. And um, you know, then the, I have time where the kids you know, are still asleep. And so I can get through stuff like that, but I, I'm nowhere like near like the, the level I think of where I should be, uh, or where I could be being more efficient. Uh, Cause there are things that I end up doing that are probably better <laughs> that other people <laughs> should do. Right. Um, so that's, I'd say there's some struggle in, in letting go. Um, right. So, but I think there's challenges around time allocation, time management, um, uh, you know, I know you, uh, you advocate for, right. Like a kind of ranking of what's going to have the biggest impact. Right. Um, and, and spend your time there. I am probably still struggling with that. Right. So in, in part, I struggle with that. And um, what's next is I love building products. I love building physical products. Um, so we have our, yeah, our Kickstarter for the second edition dashboard wireframe kit coming up. Um, I will, I'll still keep building products, but I'll, I'll also shift more into sharing and distilling into training courses. Um, so I'll, I'll be doing that, but, um, I think the fit that there's just too much excitement and it's too enticing to not build products because you learn so much by doing that, by going through the process and, and, and invariably what I keep finding is you can just apply it back to whatever it is you're doing. Right. So, um, for me, learning how to sell, 
of course, is important because it's important how we sell our consulting services, but it's also important how our clients can sell what they're doing to their internal stakeholders as well. So the better I get at that, the better it is for my clients and, and my business. So yeah, I, I think next step is just doing more at scale of what we're doing, um, building more products and putting more of the knowledge into courses. Awesome. Now, where can people uh, connect with you or follow you? I mentioned your YouTube channel. I'm probably most active on LinkedIn. So if you just look up Nicholas Kelly on LinkedIn and um, our website is deliveringdataanalytics.com. So if you just want to follow anything that's going on, um, we pretty regularly put out free templates, free training materials to anyone on our, our mailing list. So, and that's another place. So I, either LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, our website, deliveringdataanalytics.com. Fantastic. Uh, well, Nick, thanks so much for for coming on today. It's I when I when we spoke last time, I expected to have you know another connecting conversation with with lots of insights. After a conversation, I uh, I read your book, um, and I got only more curious and and excited about about today's conversation. Uh, and I'm not disappointed. So thank you very much. It was it was it was a pleasure today. Thanks for sharing all the insights, and also thanks for. You know, being another person helping to bridge the gap between between data and business, and you're doing some fantastic work out there. So, uh, thank you for uh, coming on today. Thanks for having me, and um, I love what you do. <laughs> thank you for doing what you do. Uh, it's really a pleasure to talk to someone who's uh, you know has to uh, not just talk the talk but walk the walk as well. And um, it's it, you know, anytime we talk, it's like. It's it's like a you know you you have similar stories and similar experiences uh, because of the focus on people and um, you know just seeing seeing your work and your uh, what you're able to achieve as well from your background is really a pleasure. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much and uh, speak soon. Bye, Nick. Do you want people to listen to your data and increase your business impact? Then take my free email course or do the quick self-test of your data communication skills. Go to mindspeaking.com and start learning today.